This is the message we have heard that we now celebrate with one another. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Blessed are you who have not seen Him, yet you truly believe and trust Him. It is good to live in the light and not in darkness. The Lord has proclaimed a great blessing, life with the Father forevermore. Let us pray. Our wonderful and hopeful God, you have astounded us by sending among us the one who was crucified, who died and was buried, and then raised to glory. He comes now as our living Lord, defying our locked doors, banishing our fears, greeting us with peace, and overwhelming us with awe and wondering love. How blessed are those who believe him and how happy are those who receive him. Receive our thanks, our prayers, and our worship, and continue to bless us beyond our deserving as we lift up our voices to you, O God, in celebration. In the name of this same Christ Jesus, whose presence is the word of eternal life, we pray. Amen. Let us confess our sins to one another and to God. Let us pray. Merciful God, do not let it ever seem that as far as we are concerned, Christ has died and risen in vain. Forgive and deliver us from the sins that can hamper and harden us against the good news of Easter. We confess to you that sometimes we live with pessimism, as if Christ was dead and buried forever, leaving us to go it alone. We confess to you that sometimes we live with guilt, as if Christ's forgiveness is only attainable by those who are worthy. We confess that sometimes we live like paupers in the midst of the riches of Christ's grace. Forgive us our negative thoughts and fill us with the joy of your Holy Spirit. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Friends, hear the good news. Hear what is true and worthy of accepting, that God was in Christ not counting up our sins, but pardoning our offenses. As far as the east is from the west, so far has God removed our transgressions from us, Therefore, know that in Christ Jesus, God embraces you, God forgives you, and God strengthens you to walk in the light. Thanks be to God. Friends, welcome to this time of worship at Timothy Eaton Memorial Church. And whether you are listening on the radio at Chin 1540 AM or watching the service online today on our website, on Facebook, or even YouTube. Our hope is that each of us, no matter where we find ourselves, uh, we will truly find joy in fellowship with each other and with our God. One important announcement. Under Reverend Lori Diaz's mentoring, we are offering again the popular Hearing God Seminar. It begins this Wednesday, April the 14th, at 7 o'clock until 8 o'clock, and then continues every Wednesday until June the 9th. So please see the information on our website where you uh, also need to register for it. And now John Rudder's All Things Bright and Beautiful.
Good morning, everyone. My name is Nupur James. I'm the Director of Youth and Children's Ministry here at TEMC. I hope you're staying inside and keeping safe. Today, I wanted to talk about self-worth. And we have talked about this earlier, so you might remember it from past, but I thought it was a really wonderful reminder for us to remember it today. Um, I have this $20 bill, and you know, if I'll ask one of you how much worth this $20 bill is, most of you would say it's $20 worth. And if I'll crumble this, and then I ask you, oh, how much is this $20 bill is, even it is crumbled and looks really weird, you'll still say that it is $20 worth. In the same way in our lives, even regardless of what we do and who we are and the kind of a sins we commit, it doesn't really change our worth. Jesus have died in that cross for us and for our sins. And no matter what we do, it doesn't define us because God has loved us and he has showed us in that cross. So I just wanted to remind you and assure you that no matter what others say about you, no matter how you feel about yourself even at times, but I want you to remember that Jesus, who loved us so very much, have died in that cross. We just celebrated Easter last week. So it was. it is such a good reminder that the sacrifice Jesus have made is for us to remember how much we are worth it. And in all honesty, if you and I will be, will be the only person in the earth, he would have still come and have done the same thing for us. So that much we are worth it. And in Romans 5, 8, it says that um, we were still sinning and he died in that cross for us. So, you know, we should have an assurance that no matter who we are and what we do, we are still so much worth it. So I hope you take this message and resonate in your heart today. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of the week. The scripture reading this morning is from a New Testament letter, 1 John chapter 1 through to chapter 2, verse 2. We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. This life was revealed and we have seen it and testify to it and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. We declare to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us and truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our, our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from Him and proclaim to you, that God is light, and in Him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with Him while we are walking in darkness, we lie and do not do what is true. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. These are life-giving words of the living God. Thanks be to God. Would you please join me in a moment of prayer? Lord Jesus Christ, you are the word of life, and your word nourishes our souls. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. 
Recently, in one of the discussions in our Lent study group on Dietrich Bonhoeffer, our group reflected on a question that was raised in the book about whether sin is taken seriously anymore in the church or by Christians today. Now, in some periods of history and in some parts of the church, maybe we have seen uh, an unhealthy obsession with the evil of sin and, and, uh, and harsh punishments inflicted because of it. But at times the pendulum has swung and sometimes there's been a tendency to dismiss sin and, and a belief that what we do is not important and it only matters what we believe and not how we live. It was interesting in the discussion group to hear people's thoughts and questions on a topic that normally isn't particularly fun to talk about. One of the members of the group made the comment that they don't hear a lot of ministers talk about sin anymore. And I suspect there may be a number of reasons for that, aside from the fact that it's just not fun. I'll let you in on a little secret today. Ministers don't particularly relish the thought of talking about sin, but we kind of have to. It's, it's, you could say it comes with the job, right? One of the things that Bonhoeffer wrote that struck me during the Lent study was this. He wrote, nothing can be more cruel than that leniency which abandons others to their sin. Nothing can be more cruel than the leniency which abandons others to their sin. Why would he say that it's cruel to be lenient about sin? Well, because sin is inherently destructive in our lives and it causes our relationship with God who loves us and who offers us abundant life to be strained or even broken. So Bonhoeffer's idea is that the most loving thing that a Christian can do for another is to confront problems of sin and address them. So if we truly love you, we ministers have to talk about sin because we care about your lives and about your relationship with God and with others. Ever since the, the positivity movement came along as well, talking about sin is seen as a real downer. Norman Vincent Peale taught us all the power of positive thinking. And self-help gurus have told us to focus on our strengths and not on our weaknesses. That is until Dr. Phil came along and said, you can't change what you don't acknowledge. Sometimes focusing on our strengths is better than worrying about our weaknesses. If all we ever do is uh, focus on improving the things that we're not good at, then we may miss an opportunity to add value to the world in the area of our strength. But when it comes to our Christian life, we really do each of us have to spend time focusing on our weaknesses, not on other people's weaknesses, but on our own weaknesses. Because our weaknesses or our sins, to use the biblical term, cause our Christian walk and our relationship with God to deteriorate. When we think of the, the Ten Commandments, for example, I mean, I might keep nine of those commandments perfectly but just occasionally dabble in a little murder, right? <laughs> well, how is the quality of my Christian life then? Or if I never ever steal from anyone, but my weakness is adultery, well then probably I should work on my weakness rather than my strength if I want to improve my relationship with God and my relationship with my neighbor, who in this case would be my spouse. Now maybe I'm a little weird, 
but I, I actually like to talk about sin, uh, not, not so much about my own, but uh, strangely enough, I get a little excited when, when people start to acknowledge and get real about their own sin. And that's because I know that only once we have a profound understanding of the significance of sin will we have a life-altering experience of the go grace of God. I know that. I know from my own life, I didn't have a deep existential appreciation of what God's grace really meant until I was in a position where I had to confront the reality of my sinfulness. This morning's scripture from the first letter of John talks about sin. And so here I am. Now, it doesn't talk about any particular sin, which I am very grateful for. Um, but it talks about sin in general. And now it's written, it's part of a letter written by someone who calls himself the elder, right? And it was delivered to communities of believers that were associated with the apostolic tradition of John. And so the letter is attributed to John as a sign of respect. The first four verses of this, pass, of this scripture passage serve as a prologue that sets up the overarching theme of the letter. And that theme is that the word or the message of life is grounded in the person of Jesus, who is God's son, who has revealed the nature of eternal life, which all believers now share. The point that John is making in the verses we heard from Chris a few minutes ago is that if we truly share in the life of God, then we must be what God is. It's a tricky thought. In verse 5, John writes that God is light. And if God is light, then God's children must live in the light. Then in verses 6, 8, and 10, he presents, in, in, back in sort of a back and forth pattern, he presents three moral tests for determining whether or not a believer is truly living in the light, living in the sphere of eternal life with Jesus. And the three moral tests each have a counterpoint. That's why it's a back and forth. So it's clear to John that the quality of our religious faith can be tested, which may feel a little judgmental to us, but this is consistent with the teaching of Jesus who said, for example, each tree is known by its fruit, right? Figs are not gathered from thorns, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. The good person out of the good treasure of the heart produces good. And the evil person out of evil treasure produces evil. Jesus says we know a tree by its fruit. An orange, can say that, an orange tree can say that it's an apple tree all it wants if trees can talk. But when we see that the tree is producing oranges, we know that it's only fooling itself. So John writes, if we say that we have fellowship with him while we are walking in darkness, we lie and do not do what is true. Here he's saying there's a close link between what they say and what they do. If they say they are Christian, but their actions are not Christ-like, then he said they're living a lie, both in their words and in their actions. Now, this is not an idea that is original to John. Again, Jesus himself said, why do you say, Lord, Lord, but you don't do what I say? So then in verse 8, John says, 
If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. That is, he's saying, they're fools if they think their sin is not a problem, that they're not uh, sinning. And then in verse 10 again, if we say that we have not sinned, then we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So not only are we kidding ourselves, but we make a liar out of God because God has named our sin and brought it into light through the laws of Moses. So how can we say that we don't sin or even that there is no sin when God's law shows that there is? So John makes it clear that having close fellowship with God and living in the light of Christ requires rigorous honesty with ourselves and with God. And it requires the acknowledgement and the confession of sin. So what is sin? Why does it matter? What's the big deal really all about? Why should we talk about it? Well, on a purely semantic level, it doesn't seem like it would be that bad, really. The Greek word that we translate as sin is hamartia. And it was a term used in archery that meant missing the mark. In archery, of course, you're, you're aiming for the bullseye, but if the arrow lands off center, you miss the mark. That's hamartia. It sounds innocent enough, right? What's, what's the big deal if you hit a little off center when you're shooting an arrow? But the consequences when it comes to sin in our lives are serious, are much more serious. We get a better idea of how serious when we consider those daredevils who shoot arrows at an apple on someone's head. Now, or maybe it's the person with the apple on their head who is a daredevil. If I'm that person with an apple on my head, I don't want the arrow to miss the mark or I'm dead. <laughs> Hamartia would be fatal. Well, our sin separates us from God. And God is holy and perfect and our sin separates us from him. And the result of that is, is spiritual death. Why? Because we're separated from the source of life. We're distanced from the one who gives us eternal life. Quoting Douglas John Hall, as I, I did on, for those who are uh, listening on Good Friday, the understanding of sin that the cross of G Jesus depicts is relational. That's his understanding of sin. He, Hall says, no word in the Christian vocabulary is so badly understood both in the world and in churches as the word sin. Christians have allowed this profoundly biblical conception, he says, which refers to a broken relationship to be reduced to sins, plural, sins, moral misdemeanors and guilty thoughts words, and deeds. Hall here, of course, is drawing on the theology of Martin Luther, who defined sin as unbelief. And he said that all of the little misdemeanors <laughs> or big misdemeanors that we think of as sins are the result of our faithlessness our lack of trust in God. Whenever we commit an act that we would call a sin, such as something that hurts another person, something that violates the word of God, it's a reflection that the light of God's truth is not in us. It shows when we do this that we doubt God's commandments are valid. We don't believe that disobeying them will harm us. We turn our backs on what God has said is good and right and true 
and determine that we know better than God what is good for us. According to the Bible, the very first temptation to disobey God was offered with the words, did God really say that? Right? It's sowing those seeds of doubt about God's goodness. When Jesus was tempted in the desert, it was by putting God's plan into doubt. There was nothing sinful about turning stones into bread. There's nowhere in the Bible that says thou shalt not turn stones into bread. The temptation was to doubt God's promises, was to doubt God's plans. Sin needs to be taken seriously because whenever our hearts are turned away from God's truth, it affects our whole lives, especially our relationships with others. Dietrich Bonhoeffer in his book, Life Together, wrote, there is no sin in thought, word, or deed, no matter how personal or secret, that does not harm the whole community. It's a bit of an eye-opener. Right? It, it, it's not uncommon for us to think that when we sin, we're only hurting ourselves, right? Or that what we do makes us happy and it's nobody else's business. But when we're engaged in behaviors that are the result of sin, even if nobody ever finds out about it, it changes who we are. It changes the way we view the world. It changes the way we relate with other people. Pornography is a perfect example of that. It's so easy to consume in total anonymity and secrecy, even for children nowadays. But it absolutely changes the way we perceive other people. It turns human beings into objects for our pleasure. And it distorts our understanding of what a loving relationship should be. I tell you what internet porn is doing to the minds of our children and youth this day is absolutely heartbreaking. They have become innocent victims of a deeply evil industry. If John says that we must be what God is, what are we to do then with the fact that we know we can never be what God is? Most of us are only too acutely aware of just how flawed we are, even when we're too afraid to admit it. So what do we do? We ground ourselves in the cross of Jesus Christ so that we can come before God with Christ as our advocate. As I said, at, after each of the three moral tests, John offers a conditional statement and offers assurance to those who recognize the presence of sin in their lives, of, of unbelief, and confess it to God. After saying in verse 6, uh, if we say that we have fellowship with him while we are walking in the darkness, we lie and do not do what is true, he counters with this. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Jesus is the light of God, so it is by fixing our eyes on him that we follow him and walk in the light. In verse 8, again, he says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But then in verse 9, he counters with, if we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Not might forgive us, 
but will forgive us. Once we confess our sins to God and receive forgiveness, we don't have to fear wondering if we're really right with God, if we're really forgiven. Once a sin is confessed, it is in the past. It no longer defines us in God's eyes. God will forgive us because Jesus has died for our sins. As Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. The importance of confessing our sins is not because God is an angry judge who is just waiting to catch us and punish us and who wants to condemn us. Like I said before, it's because honesty with ourselves and honesty with God is crucial to living in a right relationship with God. And it's crucial to living in right relationship with others and even with ourselves and having peace within ourselves. Finally, after verse 10, where John says, if we say that we have not sinned, then we make him a liar and his word is not in us. John counters with a bold and loving declaration. He says this, my little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. He says that Jesus Christ is an advocate a defense attorney, so to speak, before the Father for all those throughout the world who confess their sin before God and look to Jesus' sacrifice on the cross as the event which has won our freedom. That means that when we come before God with our guilty plea, so to speak, when we honestly confess that, yes, our unbelief has broken our relationship with him, and maybe because of it, we've even done things that have hurt others. Jesus will turn to God and say, this one is mine. I died for this person's forgiveness. The beauty of the forgiveness that God offers is captured powerfully in a poem written by George Roamish, which is entitled, Forgiveness. Forgiveness is the wind-blown bud which blooms in placid beauty at Verdun. Forgiveness is the tiny slate gray sparrow which has built its nest of twigs and string among the shards of glass upon the wall of shame. Forgiveness is the child who laughs in merry ecstasy beneath the toothed fence that closes in Danang. Forgiveness is the fragrance of the violet which still clings fast to the heel that crushed it. Forgiveness is the broken dream which hides itself within the corner of the mind, oft called forgetfulness, so that it will not bring pain to the dreamer. Forgiveness is the reed which stands up straight and green when nature's mighty rampage halts full spent. Forgiveness is a God who will not leave us even after all we've done. God will not abandon us to spiritual death and God will not abandon us in the moment of physical death, no matter what we've done. If you're carrying around a burden of guilt for something that you did and you haven't confessed it, 
trust in God's invitation to receive his mercy. If you're carrying a burden of guilt for something you did in the past and you have confessed it, but you still don't feel sure that you're forgiven, trust in the promise of God, which is sure and true, much more so than our fickle feelings. The sureness of God's forgiveness was shown on Easter Day when God took Jesus' sacrifice and raised him from the dead, offering new life to all those who receive it. This is the assurance of forgiveness that we have in Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Let us pray. Holy God, thank you that our faith rests on the revelation of a tangible life, which our Christian ancestors actually heard, looked at, and touched. This faith is palpable and real as we fellowship with one another and with our Heavenly Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. This faith is life-giving and cleansing because we tell the truth about ourselves and our sin. Wonder, praise, and worship fills us with joy and hope. Thanks be to you, O God. Once again, we bring the diverse needs of church and world before you. God of Easter, worthy, worthy of every confidence, wherever the unconstrained grace of Christ Jesus is known, may it also be freely shared. We pray for the billions of people in this world and for your servant, the church, serving in almost every land. We pray for the witness of the church in whatever community it is found. Keep the church loyal through times of harassment and suffering. And what may be more challenging, keep the church faithful in times of prosperity and comfort. We pray for the church wherever it is in dialogue with other peoples. Keep it humble yet absolutely true to the good news of Jesus Christ. Keep the church open to anything that you want to say to us through others. We pray for our country of Canada with its many strengths and its weaknesses as well. Bless those political and community leaders whom we respect. And what is perhaps more challenging for us to ask, we pray for your blessing on those who disappoint, frustrate, and even anger us. We pray for other nations and their leaders, especially those that are struggling against heavy odds to maintain the well-being of their citizens. We also pray for any nations that despise or would spitefully abuse others, at times even their own citizens. We pray for the hardworking immigrants who have brought skills and wealth to our country and whose diverse cultures have so enriched us. And what is perhaps more challenging, we pray for those refugees who come at times uninvited to us with nothing but their great need. We pray for friends and family who love us well and whom we love dearly in happiness or in grief in sickness or failure, in success or failure, in sickness or in health. We also pray for those difficult people in our lives whom we find it hard to love or like. We pray, gracious Redeemer, for each other gathered within the sound of my voice today. We especially pray for those who are suffering physically or emotionally or spiritually. Be to each one the strength, the encouragement, the healing they need, we pray. God of the risen Christ, please endow us, please endow your people with more of his kind of love, more of his kind of faith, more of his kind of hope. For yours is the kingdom of love, the power of love, and the glory of love now and forever. Amen. Let us continue to pray together the prayer of our Lord Jesus, who taught his people. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. 
Friends, we are Christ's church with ministries whom God has gifted to us. Let us not fail to give financially so that these ministries will continue to be shared here where we live and throughout the whole world that God so dearly loves. Amen. May the deep and life-changing grace of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with you today and every day, forevermore. Amen.